Hello everyone, this is 9MD. Welcome to my show, Fusion of Science and Beauty, right here in Beverly Hills. Um, and as an expert in anti-aging and regenerative medicine, you know that I always bring you the best of uh, evidence-based uh, in this field. And one of the leading psychotherapists and clinical sexologist is Judith Kurse, right here in Beverly Hills. She knows more about, um, you know, every topic that you could possibly think about that requires psychotherapy. And we're going to touch on a few of those topics. Later in the show, we're going to touch on anxiety and depression, but I think I wanted to open the show today with communication awareness, because we are in a dilemma, in the sense that our communication is becoming limited to text phone and there, and hi guys, and um, yeah, it's a great show. Um, so it's so rampant that we cannot even look at each other in the eye. So I'd like to welcome Judith Kurtz. Welcome to my show. Thank you. And Good to be I, here. I really wanted to, this is a topic that is very near and dear to me because it is truly, um, communication is a start of anything you do in life. We are human beings and as quantum physics continues to ascertain that we are in, 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 in a way all interconnected through these photons and, and all these, uh, you know, um, quantum in this, what we know is in quantum physics, there's a connection with all of us. And having said that, if we, if that is the case, and if we cannot communicate, um, that's a huge problem. And we're going to, we're relying more and more on technology on our, on our phone, and more and more of the eyes are taken into the computer, even as a doctor, as I'm a physician, and I can't tell you that a lot of times I have to go into a room and I'm so worried about documenting everything yes. and I'm putting everything into a computer and I'm looking and shifting here when really I want to be listening to, to, my, to my patient. So it's taking me extra long time because as a, in order for me to accomplish both things, I will first listen to the patient, take the notes, then I'll go and transcribe and then and put it in all as a way it should be documented, but that's double amount of time, and that's not how most people are going to do it, right? You hit my hot button. You really did, Diana, I'll tell you. Yeah. You talked about people not communicating and all of the devices, which are wonderful, we need yeah, them. Yeah, we need them. But we don't look at people like you and I are talking. We're looking at each other in the eye. We're seeing each other. Yeah. We don't do that anymore, and that's a problem. And you talked about it's not just talking. Communication is also listening. Listening to what someone says instead of talking and then going back to your iPhone and, uh-huh, uh, yeah, well, and, you know, texting as someone is trying to talk to you. Not only is it rude, <laughs> but it's, it's dysfunctional. And we think we're trying to save time by trying to multitask, that's not multitasking, that's just being rude. Right, and it's, it's quality time. With your children, I know parents go home and they'll hook the kid up with their own personal iPad and everybody's texting, computer, iPad, and my rule of thumb is after six o'clock in the evening, devices are put away and we talk to each other. We find out what's going on with this kid. We find out what's going on with our partner. And after the children go to bed, that's when couples need to sit down and I say minimum 30 minutes to look at each other like we are, talk, touch each other, and only talk about each other. Not schedules, not what's going on with the kids, Let's talk about each other. Let's connect. If you don't have 30 minutes a day to connect and communicate with your partner, you've got some issues. You've got problems. And what are those problems? Because that's exactly what I see more and more couples doing. They don't connect. They're just, even if we have this 30 minute conversation, it's not about a poem I read today or, you know, I actually went and I was um, outside and I happened to say a really funny story about maybe I happened to see you know these amazing leaves that were just on the floor and you mm -hmm. know something that would actually describe an amazing experience that you had and rather the, the conversation is um, did you go to the grocery store did you run this up or I saw this was on sale mm -hmm. and oh let's go to Hawaii or let's go to this trip or, well, how are we gonna plan our next trip or is there enough money in the bank I mean what's the next thing we're gonna buy there you go. and communication Does that sound familiar? <laughs> communication is free 
I mean, we can talk to each other. We can, if, if you can't afford a babysitter or you can't afford the vacation to Hawaii, you can go out in your backyard with a picnic basket and... What are, what's the way to start? What is like for, a, let's just start in a family situation. Yes. What is the number one thing you would just recommend? Turn the devices off. Right? Yes. We got that. But what is a leading question? What do you, without, it's because when you lead, then it always goes into like, oh, I got this on, so what, you know, exactly what I mentioned. What could we specifically ask each other? So the first thing that you have to do is for a couple to, they tell me many times, well, we, we can't find the time. Well, of course you can. It's not sitting there to find. You have to make the time. Make it a priority. After the children go to bed, you sit together for that 30 minutes. Now, you ask me, what if people aren't good at communicating? How do you start that? You start by talking about yourself. Or you can say, you know, I have an issue with the way we're not talking to each other and how can, how can I help? How can I be helpful? Talk about yourself quite a bit and then give your partner a chance to come in and say, you know, that's been bothering me too. But never, 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 never say, you do this and you don't talk to me and you. Yeah, that I ends it. it. That's the death. That's the death. Just talk about you and your concerns and who you are. The better communicator will start but make it easy and make it inviting, make it fertile for them to come in and say something about themselves, which is very sexy. Men don't talk about themselves very much. And a man who will give you his heart and soul, women find that extremely sexy. And I want all the men out there to know that. Yes. So, because men get kind of turned off just being a guy and talking about football or which is football's great but that's all they've been allowed to talk about but to have a special partner where they can share their heart and soul oh what a gift and yeah. anyone can help and are men from Mars and women from Venus yes we have to just accept it get over it and deal with it yeah <laughs> because we are different in the way we talk to each other yeah what so let's say we make it past that what can we also do to be better communicators with our children instead of always, um, you know, watching them and t because so much of society is now putting so much pressure on children to succeed. You have to start earlier to succeed. Mm -hmm. You have to win that race. You have to be, tennis players are getting younger and younger. I don't know, I think there's going to be a baby tennis player very soon <laughs> because that's how it seems. It seems you put, the, you put everybody in, in the competitive sports at a younger and younger age you put anyone who has that you recognize is, is has a you know a, an academic brilliance. You start them you know at, at the age of like babies. They're teaching them to read. So which is not a bad thing. I'm not saying that. But where do you start the pressure? How do you balance the pressure of knowing that you need to have your child succeed, and and then knowing what your child's emotional needs are? Because maybe we are producing so to speak robots, right? I think we are. We put uh, their little iPads, we hook them up to that very quickly at age two or three. And what we can do as parents is to model good behavior. How they see us interact with other people, how they see us look eye to eye with people, how they see us communicate, they're going to learn. And then we talk to them about what is it they want instead of signing them up for all of these competitive things because we want them to be the best tennis player in the world. Maybe the child wants to be a ballerina. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have to talk to the child and every child has a special little soul and special little gifts and we have to nurture that. Let them be who they are, not mold them. It's not our job to mold our children. Mm -hmm. It's our job to be with them and find their gifts and to encourage those gifts mm -hmm. and to discourage bad behavior too. Yeah, <laughs> you know? yeah. I think all in all, I think it sometimes means taking a step back and always pursuing what's good for our career, what's good for our um, uh, even even, uh, right, um, um, Bill Gates, Stephen Jobs, right, they all said it, that at the end of the day, um, you, you can be the best entrepreneur, you can be the best career person, but what really matters 
is what your family and what you think of yourself, what your family thought of yourself, and what you did for yourself and your people around you that you loved, right? People lying on their deathbed never say, I wish I had achieved or worked harder. You know, it's, I wish I had taken that vacation. I wish I had done this with my kids more. I wish I had said this more. And there's statistics in hospice that says this is, this is how people see their life. So sometimes I will say to myself when I have to make a decision or choose what I'm going to do, you know, if I died tomorrow, hmm, maybe I would act this way. Maybe I would regret this. So I try to make that in my life now. How do I live? so that if I die tomorrow, I'll say, hey, that was really a good ride. Yeah, yeah. I think it's knowing how to let go of certain pressures and learning how to let go of certain expectations for the sake of the people that you love, right? Precisely, precisely. <laughs> and get precisely. rid of that competitiveness. If we feel loved and happy about ourselves, we're going to make it in the world. We'll be fine. So that's communication. Yes. That's communication that can start just by saying, what are your dreams? What are your ambitions? Rather yes. than focusing on our own ambitions and our dreams. Oh, right. Precisely. Yeah. yeah. What do you want? It, and, and I do this with adults. Well, yeah. what is your dream? Well, if I could, I would. But you can. It may not be, you know, if I win the lottery. Right. But you can do the little things and and achieve the same happiness. Intent and happiness. Yes. Well, how do people look you up? I, I, I just, is it, uh, tell you about website. A website, I have uh, two phone numbers, I, yes. and you can call either one, yes. that's fine, one in Valencia, and then I have a telephone number in Beverly Hills. Uh -huh. yes. So call either one and you can reach what me. What are those numbers? Uh, oh. <laughs> okay, what's the website? Uh, the, the website? website? Yeah. Drjudith.com. Oh. Drjudithkurtz.com. Yes, and that's C U R T S. Okay. I'm a so. real easy person to see, so give me a call. I'll talk to you for 15 minutes for free. She's amazing. <laughs> she, and it's not only, she's not only driven by, um, by success and, 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 and other, you know, worldly means what we think of, she's driven by passion for her work, and that's the kind of person you know, you definitely would want to see. So I should be your PR agent, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Because Thank you. I really, I think it's it's phenomenal. I don't see too many um, psychotherapists that have the both sides to it. Meaning, you you not only have done the psychotherapy and and cover a wide variety of areas, but you also have the clinical sexology because this is such an important part, the sexual aspect or sexual part of us that has so much to do with how we communicate, how we project, and yes. you've been able to. Um, you know, intermingle both of those together. So yeah. I so admire you, and I'm so glad you're Thank you. in, you're just on the street. I'm going to come and visit your office. Um, Please do just to see you know say <laughs> hi to you. And um, I just think it's a, been a, a great great topic. We're going to come back uh, uh, with another topic about anxiety, depression. This has been afflicting so many individuals, yes. and so we're going to come right back after this break. Welcome to my show, 9MD Beverly Hills Fusion of Science and Beauty. And as you know, we always bring you the best of anti-aging and regenerative medicine. And one of the things in anti-aging uh, and regenerative medicine is that as an aging population, even as a young population, we are seeing anxiety and depression in epidemic proportions. In fact, there is so much of it that um, is, is, is happening and occurring it's, it's literally an epidemic. And I've got a fabulous psychotherapist. She's also a clinical sexologist. Her name is Judith Kurtz. Welcome, Dr. Judith Kurtz. You've been on my show before. I have. And, um, and welcome again because we Thank have you. a very, very important topic to discuss. Um, there are, you know, life is going and so at like 100 miles an hour. Yes. People are stressed. They get impatient. They're getting, you know, just all sorts of issues, but it's all connected with anxiety and depression. Yes. yes. Have you seen in your 25 years anxiety and depression increase? Yes, definitely. I'll tell you, people call me and what they present with is either 
anxiety or depression. They'll say, well, I'm depressed or I'm, I'm so anxious, I'm having panic attacks. Now, many right. times there are other issues and that's what psychotherapy can do. We get right into what is really causing this. Sometimes it's things that we keep inside, mm -hmm. thoughts that we just ruminate. We keep thinking the same thoughts over and over, which causes anxiety. And we get that fight or, or flight feeling you know I, why is that why is that there is so much anxiety and just like what you said the thoughts coming over and over again we're seeing more and more people doing that um, you know I, I have to tell you I think do you we, have any what, what is your explanation we don't take care of ourselves we don't communicate well now all we do is text we have short messages we don't talk about things we keep things inside and I'm very strong in saying if we talk about something it won't hurt us at all, but keeping it yeah. inside hurts us, and you end up seeing me in therapy, and I, I love that, but you know, we can get better by talking about everything that we're holding in, and we just think about it, and we don't sleep, and we don't eat, and we're a wreck, yeah. but many times that also affects sexuality, yes. so I yeah, treat that absolutely. too. Tell me about depression. Is that, um, so, you know, there's an overlap with anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. What about depression? You're also seeing an increase in numbers. What, how do you explain that? Well, there are all different kinds of depression. There's yes. uh, mild depression. Yes. There's what we would say the medium. And then there's the very severe depression, which right. has to be treated with medication. Now, sometimes the medication, antidepressants, will cause sexual dysfunction. So you yes. have to be very careful when you talk to your physician or your psychiatrist uh, to get medication that doesn't have sexual side effects. And there are some that do, yeah. but some will wreck it. And you know, Are you so seeing more? But it's almost like it's a, it's a dilemma because you're seeing a lot of this, uh, the, for example, the SSRIs, yes. things like Zoloft, like, you know, Prozac and all, mm -hmm. these are the medicines that some, a lot of people say they work, and yet these are the very ones that can cause the, you know, the, the side yes. effects for the sexual. Um, so how do you balance that? Now you're, you feel like your depression is controlled, but then you're having to deal with this, you which is no going to lead to the other inside. Right, no <laughs> right. libido. So that's going to lead to an imbalance of something else, and it's, it becomes a vicious cycle. Well, there are medications, newer medications, yes. that have fewer sexual side effects, and yes. the patient has to be educated on this and push their physician to say, look, I don't want to lose my sex drive. This is terrible. Yeah. Yeah. So we need to do that. Also, I think what causes a lot of, and why we're seeing so much, is we look at television quite a bit. I love television, I watch it too. But we see this perfect life where, that everyone is living except for us. We're the only ones. And there's you also... Think that, that feeds into it? Oh, I think it definitely feeds into it. And then there's also uh, situational depression. There's chronic depression, dysthymia, mm -hmm. that people present with, and that has to be treated. But situational depression Therapy can be so helpful, whether it's a breakup of a relationship, a bad job, just a place you're in in your life. And we can work through those changes and perhaps get much better without depression. What, what, is, what is, just give us, an, I know every person is different, but just what are some of the typical things you would do, let's say, in a session? Um, because no one, so many um, globally, a lot of people still are kind of, oh, I have to go see a you know, psychotherapist, right? <laughs> they here, it's, it, here it's like, okay, no-brainer. It's like everyone is, it's, it's almost like if you don't have a psychotherapist, there's something uh, odd. But wh how do, what would you do? What would you do in a typical, let's say somebody's depressed mm -hmm. or they're very anxious. What do you do in a situation like that? Well, what I do in my office is yes. I talk to the patient. They come in and... I try to make them as comfortable as they can yeah. be, and after a few minutes, they're generally pretty comfortable with me. Um, I ask the right questions. They start telling me what they think is wrong, and that's never what is wrong. I always know there's something else, and, and I've been doing this for so long, it's kind of intuitive, and with training and asking the right questions. Right. And my job is to get the patient to where they need to be, not to where they think they need to be, but where they need to be and have that aha moment. I wow. get it now. Now I can change. Wow. And to get them to change themselves. 
What do you What do you feel in the last twenty five years, um, and you've been doing this so long? Um, what are the improvements that you see that that have been made in the field of psychotherapy and um, you know and and clinical sexology? Better medications for one, mm -hmm. and that's for the the chronic and severe, and people's acceptance of going to see your shrink. Yeah. You know that you can have your shrink, and it's okay. we try to it's pull. It's okay, our, right? It's popular. It's even, you know, it's yeah. trendy. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. people like to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and say, I can do this by myself. And they think they're weak if they can't. Yeah. Sometimes life is overwhelming yeah. and they need a professional. Your neighbors are wonderful. Your friends are wonderful, but they're going to have a bias. But to come to a professional who's going to be warm and caring and get you through this and, and ask the tough questions and get you to to say the things that you don't want to say. Yeah. What, um, you know, everybody wants to, you look gorgeous. You have oh, this glow about you. Thank uh, you. We all want to know what you're doing. I'm going to take a little sidestep and just ask, what do you do? How do you walk the talk? Um, first of all, let's start for what do you do so that you don't develop anxiety, depression, and to keep yourself, you know, uh, physically and mentally, first mentally strong. What do you do? The number one thing for me is my work. I love working and I yeah. love being what? with my patients. So you love what you that do. That keeps me excited. So uh, you're passionate about what you do. I am right? so passionate about it, yes. And to so see you. people with the aha moment, that's the best. Doesn't get any better. And myself, I, the first thing I do when I wake, well, I, I do make my bed first thing every morning, never stop from that. And I meditate for about a half an hour. What is meditation in that regard? Tell I, everyone is different to everything. I think it is different. What I, I sit quietly, very quietly, peacefully, not anything on TV, radio, mm -hmm. and just sit and go deep within myself. Sometimes I have a question that I want to be answered, and then I listen, and the answer comes. Mm -hmm. It takes a lot of practice to mm -hmm. get there, but mm -hmm. that's what I do, and somehow it gets my day going. I mm -hmm. eat a good breakfast. I, what, do you, what do you eat? What, now I'm eating um, Whole30. Yeah? And it's wonderful. A paleo diet, because yeah. I, I do like meat, I'm sorry, but, <laughs> you know, but uh, paleo Whole30. And I order from a, a chef that delivers all, all the meals that I want, and I just that put is. them in the microwave so I don't have to, to worry. I can take something to the office, and it's delicious and healthy. Okay. So I think if we... Uh, stay that way, eating healthy, and I will have a glass of wine at night, red wine. I think mm -hmm. that's also healthy if you don't have an addiction with, right. with alcohol. And, and how much water do you drink in a day? After, before I meditate, I said that's the third thing I guess I do. I drink an, an entire bottle of water when I get up in the morning, and then I continue drinking water all day. That's all I drink. Fabulous. Just water, no what soda. About, what about tea or coffee? Rarely, I will have one cup of coffee in the morning, mm -hmm. um, and then I, I get up. I have, I have a dog, mm -hmm. which I think you know, they're wonderful for our for yes. our mental health. Yes. And I take my dog for a nice long walk before I go into the office, and I walk him two or three times a day. So Fabulous. it's interactive, it's fun, yeah. and I play golf when I get a chance. So, so you do all those things to keep yourself balanced. Mm -hmm. And what it, what do you find as a number one? thing people lack when they come to you with anxiety or depression. What is like when you say you ask all those sorts of questions, and I know it's difficult, every, it's different for everyone, mm -hmm. but is there something that's a common theme with patients who are having anxiety or depression? Not talking about the real issue. Wow. The And keeping it inside, and you know, soon it just bubbles up, and it physically can hurt you. Many times they'll go to their physician first saying, you know, oh, I, I feel bad, give me a pill or something, yeah, instead yeah. of taking care of the issue. Or, yeah. or they'll, you know, get something physically done for them to make themselves feel better. But it's still there. And until you throw it up, you're not going you're you're not not gonna to get, get better. better. Yeah. Do, and even though they think they know it, it's not really what what they think is, it is, huh? Correct. Wow. They're looking generally for something pretty easy, but we have to do the work, and I know everyone I've seen improves, and they get better, because 
a good therapist and a seasoned therapist knows how to get that out of them, you know, knows how to pull it out with a lot of love, <laughs> a lot of love. Fabulous. Um, what is your website? Because I really want people to be able to look you up. Um, you have been so phenomenal, you know, in, Thank in you. all that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Dr. Judith Kurtz. Dot and, com. and how, um, I know you, uh, are, you have two offices. I have two offices. Yeah. I have an office in Valencia. Yes. And I'm in Beverly Hills two full days a week, um, accepting new patients now in my Beverly Hills office. I'm so excited about being here. Fabulous. I'm on Roxbury, and, uh, and, and give me and, a call. And I, and I know before, <laughs> I know the show is coming to an end, but we, I have to ask you one other question. Absolutely. And that is... It's, it's again having to do with anxiety, depression, the medications. When, we, when there is a lack, a lack of libido or a lack of the sex drive and it's beginning to be, again, what people are seeing on the TV is not reality. No. Um, I really want people to have a take home message that it's okay, that what they're seeing on TV is not what's really, because I, as a physician, I know what I see in my office and it's very, very different than what's being portrayed. Not everyone is out there partying. Not everyone is out there having fun and just amazing, amazing lives. And it's all, it's just not all there. And even the people who portray that are themselves not having those kind of lives. We really need to get a reality check. I just want just you to what just what you said, a reality <laughs> check. We need well, to get please. real instead yeah. of comparing ourselves to our friends because many times they won't tell you their down and dirty stuff or their worries yeah. or their concerns. They'll just put on the good face, yeah. which is fine socially, but sometimes we have to do that inner work and, and it's the surgery of the soul, yeah. I think, that we have to do. We have to cut in there and take care of it because life is so short. Life is yeah. too short to be miserable, and it can be taken care of. Yeah. So, yeah. I, so audience, I really want you to hear that because don't think for a minute that what you see and what you um, experience on TV or now internet, <laughs> or now internet <laughs> and social media is really the the actual reality because you're setting yourself up for failure yes. if you're looking to other people's lives to give you. Um, it's great for motivation perhaps, but you can't, it's not an end all. It's simply a way to motivate yourself to perhaps take care of yourself better or to do something better that you see someone else. But don't compete with that person, compete with yourself. And, and spend quiet time, time alone, quiet time with your partner, with your friends, instead of watching a game together. Talk. Just talk, get to know each other, and, and intimacy is what is so missing and causes libido to decline. Yeah, and all these other issues um, to start. So you heard that from the best experts. Thank you so much. <laughs> again, so I'm so glad you, you came on my show. Thank you so and much we'll for having me. back again, but it's a very, very uh, important topic. It is. And it's not simply fixed with medications, anxiety, and depression. No. Please um, make sure that you see a, a psychotherapist and also someone who's also right along with that has knowledge about um, sexology. So that was the whole purpose of the show is that um, you need to have both of those qualifications when you go see um, a therapist. Thank you everyone. This is Nina MD. We'll be back next week with a fabulous show. This is Fusion of Science and Beauty right here in Beverly Hills.